Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus today. I'm Trace. This is part three of three in our series about internet obsession. Make sure you subscribe for all of the episodes in the series. If you've missed the other one today, they are out with a new episode all as one audio story over on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, you name it. The audio podcast is there. In Act 1 and 2 of this series, we talked about how computer programmers and web developers create products that take advantage of our brain's reward systems. But that isn't actually a new idea. We've been doing this for a long, long time. But today, we're going to talk about if any of this is a bad thing, and what if it's just a better way to experience reality when you're on the internet. And to that end, we're going to dig into the possible technology advancements, problems with tech and development, where we will take our fixation next in the world, and of course, the design of things to come, all thanks to our obsession with the information out there. So let's kick into it. So after learning about all of this stuff over the last two parts, you could probably be pretty confident that technology is reworking how our brains work. It's rewiring them, is what people tend to say. When we have cell phones and computers around, something called cognitive offloading comes into play. So let me give you an example. What is your childhood best friend's phone number? Mine was 555-9379. I know that's a fake phone number, but I'm not gonna let you call Pat and Mike. Brian doesn't even live there anymore. I know so many phone numbers because I had to remember them. How many today do kids know? Do you know any phone numbers at all? That's cognitive offloading. How about emails of people that you've met in the last couple of years since you got a cell phone? You probably don't remember any of those. And that's because you keep them in your phone. You offloaded that information out of your brain into something else. There's a study in the journal Memory that looked at this a little more closely. They gave people trivia questions, and then they either allowed them to use Google or didn't to answer the trivia questions. Those who were allowed to use the search engine were reliant on it. They answered that question, and then they were more likely to answer subsequent questions, even if those questions were easier. However, if people didn't use the search engine at all, they were more likely to rely on their own memory at the first question and also think about the second phase of questions before they would reach for their smartphone to try and answer it. Memory-reliant participants were also quicker at answering trivia questions overall, which means the internet doesn't actually make you faster. It's the other way around. There's a really good write-up on Big Think about this as well. This is changing how our brains interpret the world. For example, if you only lived in a bunker with a small population, you'd not really know what to do if you were dropped in Times Square. And this translates from the digital to the real world in interaction as well. Think about technology and how it's changed how we interact, right? We're connected, but we're not conversing. Some students don't even know how to have a conversation because they've never lived without a cell phone that they can text each other. We're together, but apart is how it's often referred to. Sure, you're on Facebook and you're looking at baby pictures of your friend or your cousin or whatever and now the baby isn't a baby anymore, it's a small child. And you're like, wow, I've watched it grow up. But have you ever talked to it? Have you ever talked with the person whose baby it is? Have you ever seen it in person? Would the baby know you if you met it? Sure, you know its life, you know its personality, but do you really know it? A conversation could change all of that, but we don't have a lot of conversations the way we used to. Plus, we could have a problem with empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand and share feelings of another. It's different from sympathy. Sympathy is more like pity and sorrow. Empathy is I'm in your shoes, right? Rianne Eisler at the Center for Partnership Studies said that we are restricting empathy only for those who are, quote, like-minded. And that's new. We can train people to be empathetic, but we need to know to try and train them. We need to assume that the reality that we live in now is using phones and the internet all the time. It's the information obsession that we wanted and that we asked for and now we have it. But it's changing fast and there are no real answers. But if we pretend like someday we're gonna go back to the past, we're never gonna do this right. So with that in mind, I say let's choose to embrace it. And moving forward into the future, what can we use this for? We can use it for good. I studied behaviorism when I was in college, uh, so call me a behaviorist if you want, but I think that hyperrealism might be a way to use our information obsession for good. Hyperreality is based on an augmented reality concept. Essentially, we harness the reward systems in our brains that we've been talking about, and also the technology and its ability to use behavioral psychology to make us do things, but we do it for good. So for example, 
Augmented reality, you've probably seen before. Yelp had this thing called the Monocle for a while. It was really crappy, but it existed. If you have a new iPhone, you can look for an AR app in the App Store. It overlays digital information through the camera. It uses tech inside of your phone to put a digital thing into 3D space. It's actually pretty amazing because right now, they come in every single iPhone. And mark my words, Apple did this on purpose. We're going to get a product from them at some point that moves the AR from your cell phone to your face. It's going to happen, but I digress. That's not really what this episode is about. So here's how our addiction to information could be used for good. We love rewards, right? And our love of reward could change the world. It's been a minute, so let me really quickly explain the reward system in the brain. It's what encourages us. We've got dopamine in there. It squirts out, and then we're like, oh, I want to do this some more. Behaviorism are specific targeted behaviors, and we reinforce or punish the actions that mold that behavior. So whether that behavior is keeping you on Facebook or whatever, this is how that works. Behaviorists know this, and they've already used it in real life. For example, at school, if you get five points just for showing up to class, those five points are based on a behavioral contingency. The idea being you would fear to lose those five points, so you show up to the class. Especially if five points is a lot of points in that class. I mean, you don't even know. Hyperreality might be able to take advantage of this as well by overlaying that information right in front of your face. This works for getting kids to go to class, but it can also work for getting people to raise money for a charity or register to vote, to learn a mathematical concept by giving points at each stage, to understand the lifestyle of a different culture. If maybe you read about it, you get some points. We just need the tech to catch up. And there are some more examples that are used out there in real life. You can get points for brushing your teeth. You can get points for listening to the news, a high score for how long you've held a conversation with a friend. You can unlock achievements for visiting new places, for challenging your worldview, or for trying new food. The options are really, really endless. You could even go the other way and say you have to pay points if you want to watch trash TV or skip a workout, or when you try and share fake news if it's actually fake news. Basically, we could use the behavioral psychology used by app developers, and we can use the reward system that we know we already have, and instead of applying it to come back to my website, watch my YouTubies, you could apply it to doing a good thing that benefits people in the real world. But of course, there's still a problem here, and that is addiction to the internet. What if back in the 17 and 1800s, they were right about books? That they were right about how we were exaggerating the world 10 times more than reality, making the world seem somehow lesser? It's one thing if we do that on the page. It's another thing if we do it in front of our eyes all day, every day. I guess I'll just have to go see Ready Player One, but whatever. What if the digital world becomes better than the not digital world? What happens then? There's no real way to answer this, so if you have opinions and thoughts, you can tweet at us, at Seeker. But in some ways, there are kind of glimpses into this. Reality is messy, and you can't just control everything. But since digital is somewhat better than real, that's why a lot of people prefer text message conversations, right? If I can send you five words without worrying about micro expressions or whether I'm sweating and, you know, accidental spits or stutters or bad hair days or whatever it is, I can just give you the information that I want to give you and I get no immediate rejection as well. I can just talk to you and I don't have to worry about all of this messy reality. Virtual reality could be that same thing. What if it just becomes reality? I mean, you could argue that reading is better than not reading. Having a radio is better than not having a radio. Having TV is debatedly better than not having TV. The internet is debatedly better than not having the internet. I mean, I wouldn't have a job without the internet and TV, but that's you know just me being full disclosure. Having virtual reality could arguably be better than having regular reality. The lovely thing about this is that there is no answer. We're experiencing this now. This is the life we live. This is where scientists are trying to find answers to these questions about technologies and our brains and all sorts of stuff. We just live here. Evolutionary neurobiologist Leah Krubitzer told New Scientists, quote, I can tell you for sure that technology is changing our brains. But so far, no one knows what those changes mean. What if this is just reading mania, but on a crazy advanced scale? Wouldn't that be awesome, but also terrifying? Of course it would be. But again, nobody knows the answer to these questions. Let me end on this. Jules Verne once wrote, quote, science, my lad, is made up of mistakes, but they are mistakes which it is useful to make because they may lead little by little to the truth. My hope is that we realize that 
by knowing we have internet obsession and by knowing that we have this reward system in our brains, we have a power and we can make rules so that we don't do harm, but we help. Our information obsession isn't going away. I have it. My family has it. My sister has, that's a Star Wars thing. I don't actually have a sister. Anyway, it's everywhere. Information obsession is in everything. And what happens when it merges with our reality? Like really what happens? Nobody knows, but it could change the world. And it will, again. Thanks so much for watching Seeker Plus. I and we really appreciate it. Come say hi on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, you name it. I'm there, look for Trace Dominguez. We are there, look for Seeker. There's a new podcast episode every week on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, you name it. It's independent of the video episodes and they are new every Thursday. Check out this video for more science and thanks for watching Seeker.